Today I'm going to talk about jobs of the future and how we can prepare for them. I guess some people already know me, but for those who, who don't know, I'm a geek. I'm always, I've always been, you know, into computers since I was a kid. I learned programming when I was 12 with a few friends who are in the, audi in the audience. We had a lot of fun doing a lot of things together. And obviously, when I went to study, I went to study computer science in those French things <laughs> that are difficult to pronounce. And when I got back to Mauritius, obviously, I, what I did initially was to work as a consultant. And then very, very quickly, I realized that what I was passionate about was about sharing my love of computer science with others. So I started working in at the Mauritius Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Then, then I went to the University of Mauritius to work. And a few years afterwards, I quit university to create my own company, Knowledge7. So what I want to talk about today, especially uh, to all the youngsters in the audience, is about how the world is changing, how jobs are changing, and what we need to do on our end in order to prepare for those new jobs. So remember those ladies? Uh, I distinctly remember them. When I was a kid, like a lot of us, we used to travel by bus. And I traveled by bus to go to my you know, cousin's place in the north of the island, and there were always those ladies cutting canes everywhere. Now, if you look for them, you won't find them anymore. What has happened is machines have basically replaced most of them. Machines are very good at cutting canes. Uh, they don't cut badly. They cut on Sundays. They don't have to take holidays. And they work perfectly well. And this is normal that uh, because basically this is progress, those ladies have been replaced by those machines. Now, if you think about it, this trend is happening all over the world. Robots are slowly but surely replacing a lot of humans. This is true in manufacturing. I'm practically sure that your car has been, built, has been built by a robot. And this is happening in sales. For instance, we all use Amazon or Alibaba or AliExpress to buy other things. And all those warehouses are managed basically by robots. So a lot of jobs that we took for granted a few years ago are now being done by robots. And it's easy to say that, you know, my job requires a little bit more intelligence, and therefore my job is safe. This is not necessarily true. Because all of you understand that the next big thing now is what is called autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles. Whether it's Google, whether it's Tesla, whether it's BMW or Mercedes, all of them, plus a number of additional companies, they are working on building vehicles that can drive by themselves, basically. I don't know if you know the numbers, but Business Insider, for instance, has said that in four years, by 2020, there will be 10 million autonomous vehicles on the roads in the world. And IEEE has stated that by 2040, so in less than 25 years, three out of four vehicles are going to be autonomous, driving by themselves using their own intelligence. Now, I don't know if this is uh, frightening to you, but I guess for all of those who are working in the transport business or the logistic business, you must be, feel a little bit threatened. Those vehicles are basically going to replace the millions of, hum uh, of humans who has have jobs driving from point A to point B, okay? And one thing you need to understand is that we are not talking of radio control things there. We are talking of autonomous vehicles. Now, even this, I'm sure some of you, you are saying to yourself, my job requires much, much, much more intelligence than what is required to drive a bus or a lorry. So my job is safe. This is not necessarily true. I don't know if you are aware, but one month ago, something very, very important happened. A computer called AlphaGo, which was designed by Google DeepMind, beat the best Go player on the planet. Now, Go is a game, which we don't play a lot in Mauritius, 
But it's a game which is 1,000 times more complex than chess. And that computer managed to beat the world champion of Go over five matches. The computer won four to one. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this computer, AlphaGo, didn't work like, you know, Deep Blue 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there was a computer called Deep Blue that beat the world chess champion. How did they build that computer at that time? Basically, they built it to be the best chess player by, you know, combining algorithms and then making it know all the games which were previously played. So basically, it was just much quicker than a human, and it managed to beat the world chess player. AlphaGo does not work like this. What they did with AlphaGo was just to show it a few Go matches. From those Go matches, AlphaGo deduced by itself the rules of the game. Once AlphaGo deduced the rules of the game, it started playing against itself. Millions of matches, AlphaGo vs. AlphaGo. And what was the outcome? The outcome was a computer which could be, be, uh, beat the best human on the planet. So much so that the Korea Go Association, one month ago, awarded AlphaGo a prize. And the prize was given for two reasons. The first reason was that AlphaGo had demonstrated that it really, really tried to become a good, a very good Go player. And the second reason is that they said AlphaGo had reached a level close to divinity. Which is basically saying that for the first time in history, we have a computer which is better than humans. Now, the thing you need to understand is that AlphaGo is just an instance of DeepMind. DeepMind is much more profound than this. It can learn anything and in a few weeks or months, become better than any human being in practically anything. And this is the kind of future that we are uh, contemplating. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, which are for most tasks better than humans. So the question is, how are we going to adapt to this kind of future? One thing which is interesting is that if tasks are automated, this means that we are going to have a lot of free time. This happened just after the Industrial Revolution. Just after the Industrial Revolution with those steam, steam engines, what happened was that the cinema industry as well as the music industry were born because people had basically time to listen to music and go to the movies. So if a lot of tasks are automated, this will mean that we'll finish our jobs early and we'll get home early, and we will like to be entertained. So one category of person who is going to have a lot of success in the future are those people who know how to entertain. Those people who are creative enough to be able to create things that we would like, that we would pay for in order to be entertained. I'm talking of music, I'm talking of books, I'm talking of plays, I'm talking of videos, I'm talking of various things, mostly delivered through the internet. And if you think about it, this is already happening. The YouTuber, for instance, is a one-person company who has a channel on YouTube, creates videos, and derives an income out of it. Either it's direct income, because people are paying him for promoting some product, or it's indirect through ads. But the point is, this is already happening. People are getting more and more free time, and they want to use that time to do something nice. And whoever can provide those things is going to thrive in the future. Now. One issue with this is that we are talking of a somewhat small uh, number of people because not everyone has the capability to create something which, are, which is of value to others. So well, what about the others? What are we going to do? Now, the best way to, you know, to, to try to anticipate the future is to look at the present and then deduce things from it. Now, I'm going to show you, I'm showing you a survey which was done in, by LinkedIn. LinkedIn is basically Facebook for grown-ups and for businessmen, people who are working. And what LinkedIn uh, did last year was to look at all those people who had changed their jobs. And LinkedIn did statistics about the skills that were required for new jobs 
in 2015. If you look at those numbers, those numbers are clear. Out of the 25 top skills required right now in the world, 35% is about software development, creating software. Mobile apps, web apps, things running on the internet, it's basically about creating software. 30% is about IT infrastructure, making sure that computers work 24 by 7. We can't leave if the internet is not working. So 30% of the skills are related to that. 15% is about big data analytics. And if you add up those numbers, you'll see that it is more than 100. And I apologize for this. It was a slight mistake on, from my part. But the proportions are mostly, uh, are mostly uh, what are there. So my point is, out of those six essential skills for 2016, the first three, when you add up those first three, you get something which is close to 70% and 70, 80%, and all those things are related to computer science. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the future is going to be good for those who master computer science. It's going to be a little bit more problematic for those who don't understand computer science because there's a risk that with those coming robots, you're going to lose your jobs. Now, the question we can ask ourselves is how can we build a population which is well aware of computer science. It's, it all starts at school. We need to find a way to make people much, much, much better in science, technology, engineering, and maths. This is the way to move to computer science. The problem in Mauritius and in a lot of African countries is that people don't like science. They don't like maths. According to some figures I've read somewhere, there are only one out of four students in Mauritius who take science at Form 5 level. And because everything relies on technology now, it's not possible to go along the same route. We need to find a way to make more young people, as well as older people like me, get more into science. And here I'm not talking about learning the bare minimum to pass an exam. That's not the point. We need to be extremely, extremely good at understanding science, applying it to technology, by being engineers. And behind everything, you have maths. And maths is a very, very important thing that we need to master. This is the way for us to become good computer scientists. But I'm sure you'll agree that the way STEM and computer science is being taught right now is not very interesting. It might even be boring. You have to go in class, the, prof the teachers are not necessarily passionate about it, and therefore there needs to be something done at this level. What I've thought about is to combine STEM with arts. What I want to do, basically, is to create an awareness around this new concept, the STEMA. The STEMA person is someone who is good in science, in technology, in engineering and maths, but also who is an artist. So basically, my aim ultimately is for us to have more artistic computer scientists. So what is the concept there? The concept is that we are moving towards multimedia. We are moving towards videos. We are moving towards video games. We are moving in a lot of ways towards things that are highly, highly, highly visual in content. So when we are learning computer science, it doesn't need to be, you know, boring with just formulas. We can make people learn computer science by asking them to develop video games, for instance. In that way, they'll have to demonstrate both the technical aspects of game development, as well as being creative enough to create the, to, to create the world, to design the world. And in my opinion, this is the proper way to get more people, especially young people, interested into computer science. So what is my idea, which is worth sharing, I, I hope? What I've done is that my company, Knowledge7, which has been running as a you know, face-to-face -face training up to now, face-to-face -face training institute up to now, so we had classes where we had people coming, I've decided to stop doing face-to-face -face training. What I'm building instead is a platform. It is a platform on the internet which is going to be accessible by anyone who wants to become an artistic computer scientist. 
in a certain way, it's going to be like e-learning, except that the point is that we are going to do things which are extremely, extremely interesting, extremely visual, where the feedback is going to be immediate, and you'll have immediate, you know, more interaction between learners and those who are teaching. And this is what I want Knowledge 7 to be in the coming years. So what I'm announcing today is that we have already started working on building the platform. The platform is going to be available online. The platform is going to be accessible by anyone in Mauritius, even those who are not young. It's going to be accessible in Africa. It's going to be accessible throughout the whole world, thanks to the magic of the internet. And I'm committing that we'll have a first version by the end of the year. So, <laughs> so to conclude, I would like to say that, you know, the world is changing extremely fast. We need to adapt. And instead of imposing things on young people, let's understand why they are somewhat bored at school. Let, let us give them an environment where they can see things happening, where they can build their own games, where they can build their own robots, where they can build their own products. And let's do it online in such a way that everyone can participate, whether it's someone from Mauritius or someone from a reload, uh, remote village in Africa. Instead of, you know, always being spectators, instead of always being consumers, instead of always being users, let's build our own future. Let's build in Africa our own artistic computer scientists and let's do it together. Thank you. <laughs>